Okay, that was great. I didn't have to yell. Um, so we're back again, and Alex is going to talk to us about, uh, I think pain management is going to be part of her discussion. Um, and another very well-qualified person doing everything that she can within um, arthritis, doctor of, she's currently working on her doctor of pharmacy degree, uh, and she works very collaboratively and, and teaches at uh, University of Alberta and University of Calgary. Uh, involved in numerous continuing education events for both disciplines and I think I have it in here somewhere that uh, you've worked with uh, students a, a fair bit. So here's a pharmacist within clinic that's looking at um, uh, spondyloarthritis as well. Thank you Alex. Mm -hmm. Yeah basically what he's saying is I, I'm a jack of all trades. I do anything. Um, so today we're going to talk just strictly about pain management. Dr. Mosher and Dr. Zasina did a very good job of talking about the uh, disease modifying agents. I am not really going to talk about those. We'll talk about trying to manage pain generally. I have no disclosures. I take no money from any kind of companies. So we'll break down um, pain into a few groups. Now, it can be a bit misleading because pain often involves a mixture of all kinds of pain. And that's more or less what I'm going to try to talk about is how to treat pain using multiple drugs in order to really manage pain well. So we have nociceptive pain, meaning there's a very specific physical something that is causing pressure on the nerves that cause pain. Um, inflammatory pain is things like psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and then there's mechanical pain. And it's still very much pain, it's just a different type of pain. And how you manage it is gonna be different than inflammatory pain. Um, osteoarthritis, most non-inflammatory back pain, so that four out of five people who have back pain, that's really what we're talking about generally. Same with tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, and joint damage. So when the joint is fused or damaged, that is another type of mechanical pain. Then we're moving into nerve pain. And I'll talk about neuropathic pain first, because that's old and well recognized. And that's, again, something physical, um, either damage to or pressure on a nerve. And it's typically disc perfusion if we're talking about back pain. You can get peripheral neuropathy from some of the medications even that we use, but um, it's also very common in diabetics. You can have carpal or tarsal tunnel syndrome. And again, that happens often. If there's tendonitis, if there's inflammation, it can end up um, causing pressure on the nerve. Um, and other things that are sort of can happen to anyone, things like the neuralgia you get after shingles and that kind of thing. Then we move into pain centralization. And this has been more of a, a newer concept that um, pain management is getting into, recognizing that there's acute pain, which has very different neurological mechanisms than chronic pain. And that causes pain to change over time. Fibromyalgia is probably the most recognizable one that we're talking about there. Um, it's also very common in chronic neck and shoulder pain. People with chronic headaches, irritable bowel syndrome has been linked to this, and same with TMJ. But it can happen in any type of chronic pain. So when we're talking managing pain, it's important to sort of recognize what type of pain you're treating. So inflammatory pain, tends to be more localized to very specific areas and tenderness, like your joints when we press on them and, and uh, they're a little bit tender. Morning stiffness is generally more than 30 minutes. And again, as mentioned before, it feels better with physical activity or exercise. It usually doesn't improve with rest and it's often worse at night. It may be accompanied by fatigue or other systemic symptoms. There's often redness and or warmth, and obvious swelling. 
For mechanical pain, a lot of the things that go with it are muscle tension and muscle spasm, which can happen with inflammatory things that are going on as well. It usually improves with rest. Morning stiffness or stiffness in general is usually less than 30 minutes, often five or 10 minutes. It is worse with exercise or movement. There are no systemic symptoms. There may be grinding or popping of the joints, um, and there's usually little to no swelling. The best treatment for inflammatory pain, if it's due to your disease, is getting the disease under control. I don't want you covering up your symptoms, or at least not for the long haul. Um, we need to use the DMARDs, corticosteroids, biologics, small molecules, and especially for people with ankylosing spondylitis, um, we have lots of information that NSAIDs do have um, some disease sort of slowing benefit much more than in some things like in rheumatoid arthritis. In the meantime, we do want to treat the pain, but that's just symptomatic management. Covering up doesn't mean that you've controlled the disease. And again, NSAIDs are the cornerstone for inflammatory pain. Um, that can be oral or it can be topical using things like um, diclofenac gel. Um, you can use it in addition to oral as well, but it really concentrates in the swollen joint or the swollen area, often very good for tendonitis, um, and other analgesics. Um, I have acetaminophen there. I'm not a huge fan of acetaminophen, and there's been many, many studies recently that have shown really acetaminophen has very limited benefit in any kind of pain. But if you're on it and you get, feel better from it, that's fine. Um, it's just taking it, some people start it and think they're gonna have all this wonderful pain relief and often they don't. Um, tramadol and opioids. Pharmaceutical management of mechanical pain is somewhat similar to what I just mentioned. So oral and topical steroids or steroid, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories work for that as well. They have a pain relieving quality plus an anti-inflammatory quality and generally they're more effective than uh, other pain relievers but not everyone can take them. As you get older or if you have heart problems or high blood pressure, NSAIDs are not a good choice uh, for many people. Again, acetaminophen's there, small, small letters. Um, I just think the recent literature that's out there um, doesn't support it first line like you may read in some older guidelines. Tramadol is also an option. So it's a bit of a complicated drug. It is related to opioid medications. It's also related to some uh, medications that relieve nerve pain. And it doesn't cross into the brain as easily. So it's sort of a less problematic drug often than the opioids which are, again, also an option. Critical steroid injections can help. Local anesthetics can help. So can other topical ointments or creams. They have ones with anesthetics, heat, cold, all kinds of things that may provide temporary relief. You got osteoarthritis, the old glucosamine and chondroitin, but it doesn't really work for any other type of pain. And then if there's muscle strains or tension, muscle relaxants, a varying effectiveness from person to person. Some people find them very helpful, others find them not really helpful at all. Um, but they include methocarbamol, which is available over the counter, cyclobenzaprine or baclofen, which are prescription medications. So now we're getting into nerve pain. So for those of you with the um, spinal arthritis, often you can have neuropathic pain as well as the area between the joints becomes smaller, you can have compression of the nerves. Neuropathic pain is typically described as very sharp. It may be stabbing or shocking. Um, it can be shooting, so starting in the top of your leg and going all the way down many times over. It can also be burning, so a constant burning kind of sensation or prickling. It's also often accompanied by tingling, numbness, or weakness. And also, there's often a loss of sensation, but not always. Then we move into pain centralization. So it develops after long-term pain. It's often difficult to localize the pain. Many people prescribe it or say that it's achy or achy all over. You can often have extra articular joint pain 
So the joint itself may be fine, not a lot of swelling, um, really no evidence of active disease, but you still got all of this pain around it, maybe into the muscles. That's usually not an inflammatory issue. They may be joints that are overly sensitive to touch or heat or cold. So you may, again, it might not be very swollen, but it may be very, very tender. Even heat, cold may make you sort of bristle against that. Pain is worse than would be expected for level of disease activity. So oftentimes we'll make changes to um, the disease modifying agents, biologics, because people are having a lot of pain and that change doesn't really do much. And that may be that this is some of that centralized pain rather than active disease. And it can be accompanied by mood changes. So depression, anxiety, those often go along with inflammatory disease. And it may be partially responsible or even sort of coexist along with this pain centralization. So treatment of neuropathic pain in, usually involves removal of the causative agent, if that's possible. So surgery for carpal tunnel, removal of the disc, something like that. If it's medications causing the problem, of course we stop the medication and switch to something else. And of course proper management of the underlying condition. So if it's diabetes, you need to treat the diabetes. If it's, again, an active disease or an injury, then perhaps physiotherapy or occupational therapy um, assistance is beneficial. As far as medication goes, we've got lots. And often for neuropathic pain, it's a combination of things. It may involve sort of picking and choosing different things over time, but there's lots of them. So GABAergics are things that increase a neurotransmitter called GABA. Um, it's Lyrica or pregabalin or gabapentin are the most common. Uh, different antiepileptics. Um, antiepileptics, their main way of working is causing nerves to kind of dampen down. So if we've got oversensitization of nerves causing pain, it makes sense that something that's doing that is going to help. Antidepressants. Now, I kind of think they need to change antidepressants to sort of, again, jack of all trades, because oftentimes people are turned off when we mention antidepressants for pain, um, but they're really very effective and it may have nothing to do with any kind of depression symptoms. Opioids. The traditional opioids may work for some, may not work as well for others. It kind of depends on the symptoms, um, but methadone, which people know as a treatment for opioid addiction, actually has a lot of benefit um, in neuropathic pain far more than the other opioids. Then we've got these fancy NMDA receptor antagonists that are being studied. Um, good old cough medicine is probably the best known, but methadone has this activity as well. Topical lotions and creams. We can get all kinds of fancy creams made up for nerve pain. Um, not sure how well they work, but this certainly compounding pharmacies do all kinds of them. Nerve blocks. Cannabinoids. Um, cannabinoids or marijuana is getting a lot of attention. Um, I'm not against people trying it, but I do not support prescribing it at this time. There's absolutely no regulation of what is in stuff, what isn't in stuff. You may not be getting the same thing twice that you think you're getting. So I think that area has to come a long way before I would recommend that. Um, tramadol, as I mentioned. And then there's other injections directly into the painful area around the nerve. So what's this pain centralization? So there's healthy responses to pain, which is things like when you touch a stove and you burn your finger, you jump back. You know that's a healthy response to pain. When you first start having pain from your arthritis, that's a healthy response to pain. You know something is wrong. You need to protect that area. You need to get help that's a good kind of pain. But over time, you can get this change in how your body um, understands pain. So you get these abnormal responses to pain or other sensory stimuli. So as I said, something that normally we think would cause mild pain may be causing a lot more pain or more widespread pain. And then over time, that becomes even more significant with things like alterations in brain function you can 
what's what we call a reward deficit state. So nothing really makes you feel better. Or anhedonia, that's a fancy word for really not feeling like doing anything um, or not really emotional about anything. Depression, anxiety, and this abnormal pain modulation. And that's kind of typical descriptions of people with fibromyalgia, which can occur concomitantly with most of the rheumatic diseases. Rheumatoid, it's estimated to be about 25%. I think AS is about 15%. Um, so that's a known thing as well. So this was an interesting study that was done. Uh, Dr. Inman, who is involved um, with SPARC, and has done a couple of studies on this recently. And this one was very interesting. They looked at brain responses to pain in 17 people with uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Then they had all these fancy rating systems for the pain based on what patients were saying plus their findings. And what you can see on the right, I know it's small, but all of the people described their pain as being very mixed. So they had some that were shooting, stabbing, sharp, cramping, pulling, burning, stinging, hurting, tender, spreading, and cool. So all kinds of things are likely involved in that type of pain. So they scored it, and basically the higher the score was, the more likely your pain had some neuropathic involvement. The lower your score, the more likely it was due to disease or damage from the disease. So most of them had this higher score that looked at some kind of nerve involvement. So this is the drawing kind of showing what I'm talking about. So pain is very complicated. It's not a simple thing. And what happens is your body senses pain, sun goes up to the brain, and then another signal goes back down, and it's all related to how you're feeling that pain. So what we need to do once those signals start getting messed up or oversensitive or not feeling the way they should is we need something to interfere with those signals. So treatment is very similar to general neuropathic pain. Um, you'll see some of the newer drugs that are out there have very interesting indications. So indications are approved by Health Canada or approved by the FDA um, things that they can sort of market. We use medications off-label for things all the time, but if they have an indication, it means they've specifically proven effectiveness in each of these different areas. So duloxetine is a newer antidepressant, but it has, in addition to depression, indications for fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis, neuropathy, and back pain. So its biggest way of working is through serotonin, and norepinephrine increases. Both of those dampen down the pain signals from the brain and to the brain that are making you feel pain. Pregabalin or Lyrica also has indications for multiple things, peripheral neuropathy, post-herpetic neuralgia, other neuropathic pain, and fibromyalgia. So GABA is also very inhibitory to pain signals. Other medications that don't have those specific indications still work for them. Gabapentin increases GABA. Venlafaxine or um, tricyclic antidepressants, we've been using those for a very long time in order to help people with pain and sleep. And they also have those kind of mechanisms. So my last point is another interesting study that was done. And it shows how combining anti-inflammatory therapy with neuromodulation therapy can have significant improvement in pain. So there's 524 patients with moderate pain despite optimal NSAID therapy. So that greater than or equal to four is on a 10 point scale. Deloxetine was one of the groups, just the NSAID was the other group. And the group that had the combination therapy had improvements in every single area they um, tested, and not just little bits, quite significant in most areas. So there's a larger improvement in pain score. There was better function based on a Womack score, and it's a fancy score invented in Canada that kind of looks at how you function with your pain. The global impression of improvement, so the patient's overall impression of how much they improved was much higher. 
but there was a greater dropout rate due to side effects when using two together. Mostly nausea, dry mouth, and decreased appetite. So combination therapy doesn't necessarily just involve those two. Using multiple drugs depending on the symptoms that you're having will often give better benefit. So the pros are that pain may come from multiple sources that one drug may not cover by itself. It's a bit counterintuitive sometimes for patients to think if we use more drugs we might have less side effects, but side effects are often related to dose. So if we use multiple drugs we can use lower doses and often have less side effects. We can treat multiple conditions, often with fewer drugs, if we're using something like duloxetine that covers multiple symptoms. The different mechanisms may be synergistic, meaning one works great, the other works great, but you put them together and they work much better when used together. And even things like two ways of delivering the same drug can decrease the side effects and improve safety. The biggest thing would be topical use of NSAIDs plus oral NSAIDs or um, oral steroids and targeted steroids. Then the cons though would be it does increase cost. There may be more drug interactions. Um, most commonly would be tramadol and antidepressants um, or some medications that are used for other things. In some cases there can be additive side effects like anti-inflammatories and corticosteroids can increase your blood pressure and risk of bleeding or you may get increased sedation if you're using one of the neuropathic agents along with a opioid medication, and compliance can also be affected. My last slide, and no, I'm not advertising Walmart, I just like their, their little ad where the pharmacist said, my job is not just helping people to feel better, but to live better. It's already been said multiple times, but medication tends to be people's easy button and that's not how it should be. It should be a part of managing with all of these other things. Weight loss, exercise and physical activity, healthy diet, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, sleep, rest, proper footwear, good posture, and of course emotional support. That's it. So next we're going to bring up uh, Carolyn Johns and uh, she is an ACPAC trained uh, physiotherapist which she'll mention what that means but uh, what it means really is that she knows spondyl spondyloarthritis uh, like no one's business. Um, and she works with curriculum at the University of Alberta for physiotherapy students. So she's given back as well. So Carolyn, uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Gerald. Okay, well, because I'm a physiotherapist and we're gonna talk about exercise, I'd like everybody to stand up and stretch their backs and their SI joints. Do whatever feels good for you. And then when you're ready, we'll, we'll get started. So. I'm here to talk about all the non-medication strategies for the treatment of spondyloarthritis. And so sort of at the center of this, and I think it's been um, mentioned by Dr. Mosier, Dr. Ziuzina, and Alex that exercise is key. But there are a lot of other areas, including your diet, you know, educating yourself about the disease, maybe seeing a physiotherapist for some guidance, um, trying some complementary medicine, which I'll discuss, and even these self-help groups can help you to um, manage your disease. So if we look at the goals of the treatment of spondyloarthritis from our sort of uh, North American uh, rheumatology associations, the goals of treatment are to reduce your symptoms. That's your pain, your stiffness, and your fatigue. We wanna try to maintain your spinal mobility and normalize your posture as best we can. We want to reduce functional limitations. We want to maintain your ability to be at the workplace. And we want to overall improve your quality of life. So this is a bit of an older version of the same slide that Dr. Mosier had up. But really, the takeaway from this slide is that the 
exercise piece, the education, the rehabilitation is paramount in the management of spondyloarthritis. And that in combination with medications, whether that be non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or whether you're on one of the newer biologic medications, that exercise should always be a part of your overall management. And people that do this have better function and quality of life. This slide is a bit outdated because in the biologics, those TNF blockers are not the only medications now that we have available to us, as Dr. Mosier and Dr. Ziuzina mentioned. We have a few other um, medications on the market in addition to the TNF blockers. So there's the uh, Ankylosing Spondylitis sort of International Society and the European uh, League Against Rheumatism that have put out some guidelines for the management of spondyloarthritis. And uh, they were updated in 2016. And I just wanted to highlight there are five overarching principles and 13 recommendations. And for the very first time, they made the non-pharmacological management one of their overarching principles to highlight how important it is for people to incorporate um, exercise into their uh, life and to stop smoking and to certainly consult a physiotherapist if you're finding you need some guidance to help you with determining what is the most appropriate exercise to be doing. So let's start with exercise. That's what I'm uh, I deal with as a physiotherapist, and when you look at the studies that have been done, basically, in a nutshell, home exercise or a supervised exercise regime is superior to no exercise at all. Group exercise is probably better than people who just do a home program on their own. And then if you can add some form of hydrotherapy, so that might be swimming or an aquatherapy class, to group therapy or a supervised setting, that's actually superior to just your group um, exercise on its own. So what type of exercise? What should you be doing? Well, when you look at a specific program, it should incorporate some very specific mobility exercises, targeting your spine for those who have spondyloarthritis, and also peripheral joint mobility for those who have psoriatic arthritis and have a lot of peripheral joint involvement, or for your um, axial spondyloarthritis patients who have peripheral joint involvement too. You need to stretch certain muscles that have become shortened. You need to strengthen muscles, and especially the core muscles. And you need to incorporate cardiovascular exercise to exercise your heart and lungs and to get that chest wall moving to keep the mobility in those uh, costochondral and costovertebral joints where your ribs attach to your sternum and spine. There's some evidence for modified um, exercises like Pilates, uh, yoga, Tai Chi, and global postural re-education. And definitely, we want you to incorporate physical activity into your lives. And that can be taking a flight of stairs up to the next floor at work, parking a little further away in the parking lot to do your grocery shopping so that you're incorporating movement. So what about, well, how often should I do this? How intense should it be? And for how long? Well, it's important to know that Everybody in this room might have a very different looking exercise program and that what you choose has to be really tailored to you and your specific needs. But they know and they've done the studies that for maintenance of spinal mobility and um, posture, that consistency is what is so important and that probably daily uh, stretching is the best. From a cardiovascular or aerobic standpoint, we do sort of recommend the National Physical Activity Guidelines. However, and I'll be going over these a bit later, those may require some modification depending on the stage of your disease, how active your disease is, and, and if you have some structural uh, damage from your disease. And there may be some benefit from this short interval, more intensive doses. So that's sort of like your HIT workout, your high intensity interval training sort of workout can be um, modified and quite appropriate. So what are the barriers to exercise? Well, one of my colleagues in Toronto was involved um, in a study, and they interviewed patients with ankylosing spondylitis 
to get an idea of their perceptions of exercise and also the reality of whether they were doing exercise. And what they found was that most patients, and I'm sure everybody in this room knows the benefits of exercise, they've been well studied, but very few patients in this group were actually doing exercise. And the three most common reasons for not engaging in a regular exercise routine were that exercise is hard work. I'm really tired, I'm fatigued, and I'm too tired to exercise. Or exercise makes me feel tired. So physiotherapy is a good place to start for some people if you're needing guidance to help you get started on an exercise program. Because I think we can help you to individualize a program and to help you be successful at continuing it with an exercise program. Because I think many people know the benefits, they try to do it on their own, but they either don't do quite the right things at the right time, or they try to do too much, they hurt themselves, they get discouraged, and then they don't continue. And what a physiotherapist is able to help you with is making sure you have a really good understanding of your condition and how that might affect your home life, your work life, and your recreational life. They will address your posture and in all positions. How do you sleep in bed at night? How are you sitting at your desk at work? How are you standing? Um, how are you moving if you've got a very physical job? And help you with proper posture when you're exercising, which is so important. They're going to look at your muscles and see how tight certain muscle groups are and help you with some flexibility, especially those shoulders and hips that attach to the spine. They often get very, very um, stiff and tight. They're going to look at the mobility of your spine, and then they're going to help you with strengthening. And I think strengthening is something that we sometimes shy away of when we're sore, but it is the cornerstone of managing this condition is to have really good core strength, including your abdominal muscles, your gluteal muscles or your buttocks, and all the muscles up your spine. And of course, we recommend cardiovascular exercise and give you some good strategies for low impact. So how do you get started with exercise? Well, often we recommend that people try to set realistic goals and we, we suggest they set SMART goals. And those are very specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and sort of time-sensitive goals. And it could be something as simple as incorporating a walk to work or getting off a subway a bit sooner so you can walk one way to work and making it very specific and saying, I'm going to try to do this three days a week. And it can be very measurable because you know what that distance is. It's a one kilometer walk, it's six blocks, I'm going to do that three times a week. I know it's something that I can achieve. It's not something that's I'm setting the bar too high. It's certainly relevant because I know I need to be moving more and I need to get to work, so why don't I combine the two? And then you can set yourself up for a time um, a timeline of when you think you'll be able to achieve this and have this be a consistent part of your day-to-day -day life. If we look at the guiding principles of exercise, I think it's important uh, to know that daily exercise is probably preferable. That doesn't mean it has to be a formal program at the gym every day, but that you try to incorporate movement into your life every day. Very important to respect pain. And this is where I think some people struggle with how far to push themselves. And uh, you don't want to do a form of exercise that makes you feel worse the next day and really impedes your function the next day. You need to find that balance that makes you feel better. And for most people, movement and gentle exercise does make them feel better. Often we start more locally and spread globally. So sometimes we can choose one small area and we may start with core stability and strengthening to help you support your back and then progress and move into more of the um, flexibility and the mobility and your cardiovascular exercise. Or some people just say, Carolyn, I want to start with walking and then we'll move on to doing some of the other more specific exercises. I think it's important to have the word flexibility in your 
your vocabulary because that's what I think you're going to need to be able to incorporate. You may need to adapt what you're doing. Uh, you may need to modify what you're doing and that may vary on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. And what you are able to do on a day when you feel really good may be a bit different from what you can do on a day where your disease perhaps is flaring. And you need to have those tools so that even on a day when you're not feeling as well, you're able to incorporate some exercise. So posture, and I'm gonna get everybody to stand up once again because this is so important. What is good posture? Well, good posture is standing as tall as you possibly can. And I tell patients if they have the neck mobility to try to look at themselves in a mirror from the side. And if you can imagine if I put a plumb line down, I'd want that plumb line to hit your ear, to hit your shoulder, your hip, just behind your kneecap, and just in front of the bone on the side of your ankle. And that would be keeping the three curvatures in your spine fairly well aligned. So there are three areas that you have where you can manipulate your posture a bit. And I have to remind you, posture is a habit you have developed over your lifetime, so we're not gonna change it in one go, but I think awareness of your posture is the first thing. So you have an ability to change where you're gonna hold your head. A lot of us have posture that looks a little bit like this. And it's because everything we do in life pulls us forward. So I want you to all try to tuck your chins in and to place your heads on top of the rest of your spine. Number two, we move down to the shoulder blades. And I want you to bring those shoulder blades down your backs and um, almost open up your collarbones a little bit. And then lastly, I want you to brace your lower abdomen a bit. I want you to sort of zip up your lower abs like you were wearing a tight pair of jeans that you just had to pull in your tummy. And make sure your knees are slightly soft. I don't want anybody's knees to be hyperextended. And then I want to make sure everybody's breathing. <laughs> You want to try to relax in this position. But this is something I want you to be aware of when you're standing, when you're sitting, in, in all the things you're doing. When you're preparing food at the kitchen counter, I want you to be aware of your posture. And posture is not a static thing. It is dynamic. You are going to be moving in life, but I want you to try to make those small adjustments to keep the three curvatures in your spine as well aligned as you possibly can. And it's extremely important to have this posture when you're doing any exercise or strengthening in the gym. You want to have your core aligned. Okay, thank you guys. You can sit, sit back down. So this guy doesn't have the best posture. And what happens is when you have this sort of a posture, poor Scooby-Doo, he's got really tight pectoral muscles, probably a little bit of a tight tummy, very tight hips in the front tight calves, tight hamstrings on the muscles on the back of your thighs, and a tight neck. The muscles on your back of your neck get very tight and make it difficult to sometimes correct that neck posture. So stretching is important. And we know by some of the studies that have been done that probably daily stretching is the best. You need to respect pain. I don't know how many people I have tried to help stretch who try too hard for me and they're just thinking that more is better and their muscles are shaking and that's your muscles way of sort of protecting itself so when you stretch it's important that you go really slowly really gently and that it's a prolonged stretch you're not bouncing into the stretch and that you're breathing and that's the big thing if people are stretching too hard they're often holding their breaths so I make sure that you can breathe and focus on your breath and then usually people um, don't hurt themselves when they're stretching, and you should feel so much better after you stretched, not worse. These are just a few pictures of different stretches that we might um, incorporate into a program. There's that cat-cow sort of stretch, child pose. There's a woman at the top who's stretching her hip flexors and her trunk, um, uh, hamstring stretch, 
pectoral stretch over a foam roller and stretching the neck extensors. So these are just a few um, different ones that might be included in your program. Strengthening is the next thing that's so important and it really focuses on the core. And what is your core? It's your torso. So it's strengthening abdominal muscles, strengthening buttock muscles, and strengthening all the muscles that go up your spine and your neck. And that typically is usually very weak because people have this terrible posture and we get very shortened on the front of our bodies and very weak on the back of our bodies. So the basic principles of strengthening. So you don't have to do your strengthening every day, but probably two to three times a week it is imperative that you do. You want to make sure that you've tried to place those three curves in your spine in the best posture possible and you want to be recruiting the right muscles and sometimes that's where a physiotherapist can help you because some people haven't been recruiting the right muscles for many years and they're not even sure how to get them turned on and that's where sometimes the guidance from a physio from a personal trainer a kinesiologist can be really helpful again we usually start with very easy exercises i may start with someone lying on their back and learning how to activate their lower abdominal muscles and I might progress to what this woman is doing which is a superman or bird dog where she's actually having to engage her abdomen and she's strengthening all the muscles on the back of her spine and from here I might progress to a plank for some of you if you were able to do that so there's always a progression and it's very important to start with the the, the gentle ones, the remedial exercises, and then progress. Always nice if you can combine it with something that you have to do during the day. So I do teach a lot of patients um, strengthening exercises using the big Swiss ball, but here's a woman who's incorporated it into her work life. You're not going to sit on a ball for the whole day at work, but you could use it uh, and, and do that for small periods during the day. And when you're sitting on that ball, you will be working those core stabilizer muscles instead of just sitting on a chair. So this is a way of incorporating some strength into your day-to-day -day function. Cardiovascular exercise, aerobic exercise. We do usually recommend low impact um, exercise. So swimming, probably the best form of aerobic exercise for spondyloarthritis. It's gentle on the spine, but it incorporates wonderful rotation, um, wonderful for chest expansion. Uh, and many of my patients who have limited neck mobility use a snorkel and mask so that they're not having to rotate their heads to breathe but can do front crawl, for example, with their head in the water using the mask, and they've told me that swimming has been their saving grace. Walking, cycling, golfing, all good options. But I have to say out there, I do have some patients who were runners before being diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis, and with good medications and good control of their disease, I do have some patients who have continued to run. So there's quite a spectrum of what people can do from an aerobic standpoint. And it's very individual based on your, your disease and where you're at. We do sort of follow the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines, and I just wanted to outline those for you for people ages 18 to 64. The recommendations are 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic physical activity per week but it can be in bouts of 10 minutes or more. And that's why I highlight this slide, because I think some people think, oh my gosh, I've got to go out and walk for 30 minutes. And you don't have to. If you don't have time to do 30 minutes, you could do a 10 minute walk in the morning, you could do another 10 minute walk in the afternoon, and a 10 minute walk in the evening, and it is cumulative, and it is beneficial. So that's important to realize. Of course, this also recommends the strengthening at least two times a week, and certainly the more physical activity people engage in, often the, the greater health benefits it provides. These are guidelines, and definitely not all patients will be able to achieve that 150 minutes, and that's okay, but this gives us a, a guideline and a place to start, and again, we may need to modify. 
Other forms of exercise that have been shown to be helpful are some of these um, sort of mind-body exercises, I call them, the yoga, Pilates, uh, Tai Chi, uh, Qigong. And I've had many patients tell me how beneficial these have been, but I think the important thing to highlight is modification. And when you go to a class, you have to be very careful that you choose the right class. And certainly if you've never done yoga or, or Pilates, you're going to go to a beginner class that's going to give you all the verbal cues that you need and ideally have an instructor who can help modify as required. So if they're moving into a pose in yoga that you can't quite accomplish, they can help and give you that guidance for doing something a little bit less, less um, strenuous. Um, yeah, I think that's all I needed to say there. Complementary therapy. So patients do ask me a lot about, well, Carolyn, what about massage? What about acupuncture and things like that? And certainly I call these sort of adjunctive therapies. If you find them helpful and beneficial, um, they can be part of your management strategy, but they should never replace exercise. And as far as chiropractic manipulation goes, it's, it's very important that you're aware with this condition. There is the potential for that bony fusion in your spine, and you would never want to uh, receive a manipulation uh, to a spine that might have the potential in your spine to be fused uh, because that uh, could cause breakage of those tiny little bones that go between your vertebrae. And you're also at increased risk with this condition for developing low bone mineral density, so that would be another thing. And this is all very dependent on you, but if you do have evidence of bony fusion in your spine or you have osteoporosis, then um, manipulation is to be um, avoided. As far as access to physio here in Calgary, we have community accessible rehabilitation. Uh, and there are three locations in the city, and they do offer uh, a spondyloarthritis education class. You do need a referral, and it could come from your family doctor or your rheumatologist, and it is covered under Alberta Healthcare. And I think it's a good place to start. It's not the only place to start. Some people have seen community physiotherapists too at private clinics, just to get that advice if you need it to help you get started. So. The scientific uh, evidence uh, demonstrating beneficial, or the beneficial effects of exercise is, you know, it's indisputable. We know that probably the benefits far outweigh the risks for most adults. But because you have this condition, you do have things that you have to take into consideration. And as I mentioned before, everybody in this room will have different needs, uh, different comorbidities. Uh, is your disease currently active? Is it well controlled on a medication? And that will all influence uh, what exercise you do. I appreciate that exercise is hard. I appreciate that it would be sure nice to have a pill that said exercise that you could take and everything would be done. The newer medications in this um, disease have, I think, revolutionized um, people and their outcomes. But even the best medications aren't going to keep your muscles strong and your back moving and, and make sure you have good posture. That, that is all up to you. So the exercise piece is really important. And as a physiotherapist, I feel this is one of the most rewarding group of patients that I have the privilege of working with because when people get on board with exercise, they do so well and their, their quality of life and, and function improves and, the, and that's what we're after. So I'm gonna stop talking now and I am so excited to uh, introduce our next speaker, who is a patient of uh, Dr. Mosier's, and uh, we both have had the privilege of being involved in his care. And he's been super helpful to me with being um, a patient, uh, a sort of partner for my teachings at the University of Alberta, the physical therapy students. He's always ready to help me, and he's gonna talk to you about his journey um, with ankylosing spondylitis. So thank you very much, and I, I'll look forward to questions at, at the end. Thank you. Thanks for that, Carolyn. Uh, we have lots of questions for you, I think. Anyone else have blue forms? Okay, so wave them around and we'll come collect them. I'll start grouping. Um, I am aware of your time restriction because it's so awesome here. Awesome. Come on up, Josh. Do you have a slide at all? No, I have no 
Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Gerald. Yep. All right. Uh, good to be here today. Um, so uh, my name is Josh Salter. I've been a patient of uh, Dr. Mosier and Carolyn Johns now for about three years. Uh, pretty much right from the start of my diagnosis, my AS diagnosis. Um, so I think the easiest way for me to tell about my AS diagnosis would be to talk about how life was before my treatment, before the diagnosis, and then I'll talk about how life has changed since the, the diagnosis of the AS and what I've been doing to treat the AS. Okay, so um, in terms of back pain, for me, back pain started when I was probably 21 or 22. Uh, it was really congested in the uh, sacroiliac and the, the kind of the, the lower back area. Um, I kind of thought it was because of the, I'm, I'm also a type 1 diabetic, so I, I thought in the back of my head it might have been uh, because of the type 1 diabetes. I'm going to quickly show you uh, my insulin pump and my Dexcom. I use a Dexcom, to, it's a continuous glucose monitor, so it constantly monitors my blood sugar levels. And then I, I have an insulin pump that I use that I have hooked up to me all the time that um, administers my insulin. Um, I don't think that type 1 diabetes is all related to the uh, ankylosing spondylitis. I've been like, a type 1 diabetic for, for 20 years now since I was 14. So, um, so yeah, so the, uh, the Dexcom is just hooked up to my hip right here. Um, like I said, this just constantly monitors my blood sugar levels. So I, have a, uh, I get a reading on my device here where my blood sugar level is at. And then I take that reading and I plug it into... Uh, the Omnipod here, which is my insulin pump, and uh, once I plug yeah, once I plug that reading in, it'll ask me if I need to eat. I hit the yes, and then it asks how many carbs I need to eat, and then I hit uh, how many carbs I eat, um, and then it uh, ad administers my insulin. Prior to this, as you probably know, I, I was checking my blood sugar constantly, you know, between four and ten times a day. I was, you know, giving myself injections between four and eight injections a day, so it's pretty life changing for sure. I'm very, very happy to be on that. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is Dr. Mosier and Carolyn Johns got me rolling on the, the, the insulin pump, so it's, it's uh, helped my life out uh, tremendously. Um, so yeah, in terms of the back pain, uh, like I said, the back pain started for me, uh, lower, lower back. Uh, it was sacroiliac, lower, lower back areas. Um, everything was tough, you know, getting out of bed was tough, work was tough, uh, everything was tough. Uh, the, the toughest thing for me was, as probably a lot of you guys too, would be uh, getting my shoes on, get my socks on in the morning. I struggle with that constantly. It was a very, very difficult getting the, the shoes and socks on in the morning. Um, you know, I, I manage, though. You manage with everything. I manage with, with doing that. Um, I'm just going to open up a piece of paper here. I've got some notes written in. Okay. Oh, yeah, so when I was at yeah, 21, 22, I, uh, I, 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 I worked uh, part-time. I went to school. I was going to school in Kamloops, so I worked part-time. Um, you know, I was, very, I was very active. I was very, very active in high school, too. I played, you know, basketball in high school. I constantly skied in high school, so I was very, very active in high school. Um, yeah, 21, 22 came along, and um, I, I started to slow down a little bit. Uh, basketball wasn't the same. Uh, soft, I couldn't even play softball. I couldn't really run, play, play softball, so that I couldn't really do that anymore. Um, I did ski, though. I continued to ski right until my diagnosis. But I, I skied on the weekends, that kind of thing. Um, constantly skied, pretty much on the weekends. Um, so the lower back, uh, for me, became the biggest problem probably when I was 24, between the ages of 24 and 30, uh, it was probably when the, the, the most severe back pain for me was, was in between that, that area. Um, I, like I said, I couldn't sleep at all. Put on shoes and socks was tough. Um, I, at the time, I was working as a floor installer, so I actually had a very, very physical job. At the time, I was installing the like, hardwood and tile floor, so that was very, very physical. And I thought in the back of my head, maybe all the back pain was because of uh, the jobs I was doing, the, you know, the floor installations and that kind of thing. And I also thought maybe it's complications because of the type 1 diabetes. I, I thought maybe this is, a lot of the doctors growing up when I was you know, 15, 16, they always kind of mentioned that diabetes would give me complications down the road. And I thought this was maybe that, but um, it wasn't the case. So yeah, um, I had a major difficulty getting out of cars. Getting in and out of cars was very, very hard for me. I had to literally grab my head sometimes and, and kind of give her one of those to get in and out of vehicles. Um, and another major problem with me, as I'm sure it is for, with a lot of you guys, was the uh, iritis. I was constantly getting the iritis. I think it, before my diagnosis, in between the, you know, the age of 25 and 30, um, I probably had iritis you know, five or six times. And um, <clears throat> I was seeing the same doctor continuously for the iritis. It seemed like I seen, uh, I don't want to give the name, but I was seeing the same doctor for the iritis. Um, and at no point did he ever mention that it might be related to the, to the uh, arthritis. And I kind of hope now, I kind of look back at it now, and I, I think, um, 
Uh, Gerald mentioned it previously, but I think it, it is important for, for a lot of the uh, eye doctors to be aware of it, because I think, I think the eye doctor could have probably had me diagnosed when I was you know, 25, 26, when the iritis was happening, but uh, failed to do so. So yeah, I was getting the iritis um, pretty much constantly, and how that all works, as I'm sure most of you guys know, is you go to the, pretty much go to the hospital, you get the, get the, uh, the I think it's called, uh, it's, it's a steroid of some sort, a kind of pregnisone maybe. Yeah, you take the prednisone, yeah, and eventually it goes away um, within a couple of days. But uh, it, it was getting to a point where it was very, very bad. And then, um, yeah, I was at work one day. I work at the Greyhound, the downtown Greyhound in Calgary. I was at work one day, and um, it, was, it was a pretty good day. It was, it, I was at work eating lunch, and a commercial on TV popped up, and it said, um, pretty much you have, if you had a back pain for more than three months, uh, ask all the, you know, the usual questions, um, whether or not a, uh, a back pain's less severe when I'm working, which it was, you know, when, when I was actually moving around doing that kind of thing. Back pain didn't diminish, but it did go away quite a bit. Um, and asked a, a bunch of questions. And then one of the questions I asked at the bottom was uh, if, I, if I had experienced iritis, which I, you know, which I had probably five times at that point. Um, so right then and there, I knew, I knew uh, that, that it was an actual condition. So and that was, I was probably 20, 29 or 30 when that, that all happened. I knew there's a name for the condition, which is great, right? Um, I didn't really act on it right away, but I knew that uh, something was out there. Um, and one of the reasons why I didn't act on it right away, I didn't go to a doctor right away, is because I had a ski trip planned with a bunch of friends from Golden. I grew up in Golden. I went to high school in Golden. And uh, three years prior to uh, my diagnosis, we, a bunch of the friends got together and we all went skiing or whatever. We, we kind of planned the same, to do the, the same kind of trip. And uh, I wanted to do this trip real, real bad or whatever, right? So. Um, I didn't really uh, proceed with um, going to a doctor about the uh, AS or anything like that. I just kind of sucked it up as I had been for the previous eight years or nine years or whatever. Um, and then finally the time for the ski trip happened in Golden. Uh, we're all up there ready to go and I literally couldn't get my boots on. So that was a pretty, uh, pretty trying time for me. I knew <laughs> that was terrible. Like, uh, I knew, I knew something had to be done for sure. So what I ended up doing was uh, came home from, that was right around uh, like December, the, uh, the Christmas holidays, came back to Calgary. I was living in Calgary, came back to Calgary. Um, I went to uh, the superstore in Shaughnessy. There's a walking clinic, so I just went to the walking clinic. I told the doctor what I had. I told him you know, my problems. He had me do a few stretches, uh, that kind of thing. He was uh, kind of in agreement that it was more than likely ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, and about four or four months later, um, maybe, maybe three or four months later, I was uh, seeing Dr. Mosier and Carolyn Johns to treat the AS. So in terms of treating the AS, I was a little afraid. Uh, I was a little afraid to get it treated. I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want to have to take a pill every day that would cause, you know, maybe addiction or whatever, right? I, I didn't really know what was intact for the treatment of the AS. I just knew I needed something for sure because it was, I couldn't, it just wasn't good. So um, the first thing that uh, Dr. Moser had me, had me go on was, I think it was the naproxen. I didn't get any benefits from the naproxen. Um, I only took probably four or five of those pills before I realized it wasn't helping at all. So we got off that, I got off that right away. And then I went to the um, Volterran. Yeah, the Volterran, there's, a, there's issues with the Volterran. I, I was, I, in terms of pain relief, it was, it was, there was great pain relief for the first, uh, I think, two or three days I started the Volterra. I, I, had, I had significant pain relief. I was able to bend over, tie my shoes, no problem, or bend over, tie my shoes, put the socks on, no problem. Um, everything felt pretty good. It, it wasn't great, but it felt pretty good. I continued with the, um, the Volterra for probably two, two or three days, and then on the third day, I got pretty bad stomach problems. That my, my stomach started to act up uh, quite a bit. And then I think it was about day four, I was, there was blood in the defecate, so we had to get off, um, get off the Volterran right away. Um, and then uh, I started hearing about the biologics, of course. Uh, Dr. Moser started mentioning uh, you know, the various kinds of medication I could use, and she had mentioned the biologic. She had mentioned it's not a pill, it's, uh, there's no kind of psychoactive effects to it and, and all that kind of thing. So I, I was a little hesitant, because I, I had heard of Humira on TV and the side effects or whatever. I was a little hesitant to go on to it. Um, Nonetheless, so I got I got on the biologic uh, I got on the biologic right after the uh, the Voltaire and, and I'm just being honest the life since being on the Symponi it's not the uh, I'm not on Humera I'm on Symponi she, she I, I, had, I had the option of either taking Humera or Symponi uh, the difference between the two is I would have to take the Humera every three weeks whereas uh, when I started off taking Symponi or the Symponi I was taking it every every four weeks so that was the only difference so I opted to take the, start with the Symponi. Um, now that I'm on the Symphony, um, I've been on the Symphony for now for three years, and I take it every three weeks now, every three weeks. But um, 
when I first started the biologic, it was, <laughs> it was really, really life-changing. I was, uh, you know, the same old routine. I'd get home I'd, in a world of pain. Um, you know, I'd turn the TV on in my recliner or whatever, and I, I had the biologic in my hand. I was looking at it, kind of just, all right, uh, I will, I'll just try it out. So I injected it in my leg. Um, uh, yeah, so I injected the biologic in my leg. I was, you know, like I said, laying back in my recliner, didn't think much of it. Two, about maybe an hour, half, two hours after, I, I go to get up, and uh, I couldn't believe it. Like, every other time I go to get up, it's real, real agonized. I felt like, a, you know, a 90-year-old man, like a like, tin man. I go to get up, and I just couldn't do it. Two, two, literally two hours, hour and a half after taking the biologic, I, I got up and I straight back. I sort of, I couldn't really believe it. I, I thought it was yeah, pretty incredible. So um, that was a real, real, real great day. Uh, and I've been on the biologic ever since. And uh, in terms of problems now, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of problems right now. I don't think, there's, you know, there's a little bothersome in, in, in the right hip. Um, when I was sitting down for the last hour and a half, you know, you, you, as most of you obviously do as well, you get cramped up or whatever. But um, Compared to where it was before, compared to where I was, you know, three years ago, it's 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 really been significant help. So I'm yeah, I, I really the biologics have helped me helped me tremendously, and um, I, yeah, I don't take anything else other than biologic, and and I, and I use cannabis as well. But those are the only two medications I use to uh, deal with the ankylosing spondylitis, which which is good. I don't uh, don't drink any kind of alcohol or anything like that. It's just I live a fairly fairly healthy lifestyle, other than uh, taking the biologic or whatever. But it's helped me tremendously. So. Um, I think that's basically, basically what I have to say. I, I think I might have, oh, pardon me. I'm going to talk about the treatment I've gotten from Carolyn Johns as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so. Good catch there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, Carolyn Johns has been a, a significant help in my, in my AS as well. She's adamant about the posture as well. She's, she's always telling me to keep, keep a good posture. Um, in terms of exercise, I'm constantly getting exercise. I, you know, I ride bike. I, uh, I keep on telling her I'm going to start uh, doing the cross-country ski as, as well as uh, skating. I haven't gotten into that yet, but I, I'm probably going to get into that this, this winter. Um, but no, I, I, stay, I stay very, very active still. I walk everywhere. I, I, don't, I don't drive. I walk. So, I, I mean, in terms of the exercise, I, I tend to stay fairly, fairly active at all, at all points. And I think that's pretty much it. Um, I don't know if that's 10 minutes or 15 minutes or not, but uh, if anyone has any questions, on the panel. Oh. So we're going to get another chair. We're going to get another chair up here for him. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Josh. Um, I don't know how you kept track of what you did say and what you didn't say and all of that, but uh, very powerful, and this is the point, right? So I hope to engage you as a volunteer uh, with the Canadian Spondylitis Association. These are the types of things that we like to hear, these powerful patient stories. You remind me very much of myself. You're sitting on a panel now with the people that treat you. Uh, you're becoming part of the solution, so thank you very much for that. Um, there is a mic there. We have uh, a decent amount of time for this panel. When do we have to be out of here, Maria? Okay, so we've got about 25 minutes. Um, I've got questions here. What I'm going to try to do is group them. And if I haven't done a decent job on your question, then feel free to jump to the mic. And if you hear something along the way that triggers another question, then just jump up to the mic and we'll pause for you a bit. This one here, I'm going to pass on to uh, hopefully have some people interpret some, just some of the language. So take some time with this, and we'll get back to it. But um, so first up, I want to talk about uh, something that I haven't heard a lot of before. But is it common for um, to have hard side effects from the use of biologics. So we have a gentleman here that's uh, started to get into epilepsy, MS, lesions, lupus, and diabetes. So um, I think Dr. Zuzino, we, we were talking about this a little bit earlier with Frank. Um, so maybe we can talk about some of the side effects. Uh, I don't think that we talk very much about side effects from biologics because, um, I mean, maybe they're not as frequent as, as we think. So. Have you heard of these situations where you get into these types of side effects, have to stop, and then, and then where does that patient go from there? 
So um, any medications have side effects and biologic medications as well. So the most common problem we uh, worry about with biologic medications is a risk of infections. So all biologic medications affect your body ability to mount inflammatory response. So we're treating inflammatory conditions like psoriatic arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis where your immune system goes you know, super active and start affecting your own body. So the whole principle of treating those conditions is to lower your immune response. But immune system is very important. Uh, it's been developed through the evolution to protect our body against foreign invaders like viruses, bacteria. Therefore, lowering immune response may control your disease, but it also puts you in disadvantage in terms of body's defense against microbes. So, and that's the main concern we have with uh, biologic medications. So if you look at the rate of serious infections, and by serious infections we um, mean infections that require antibiotic therapies, intravenous therapies, or admissions to hospital. So the rate of serious infections in a general population and people walking on the street is approximately three per people per hundred per 100 people per year. So 100 people on the street, in the course of the year, three of them will end up with serious infection. People who go on biologic medications, that risk doubles. So from three, it goes to five or six. So it still remains fairly low if you kind of uh, look overall, you know, five or six per 100 patient years is not that high. But if you compare it to baseline, it's, it doubles. So that's the main concern we have. And it's sometimes bacterial infections, but also biologics can reactivate uh, kind of a chronic hidden, or we call it opportunistic infections, like TB or fungal infections or some parasitic infections. So that's why before anyone goes on biologics, we ask people to go very careful screening for any hidden infections or any chances of hovering, you know, infections that might not manifest in otherwise healthy person. So that's the most common infection and we uh, consult patients extensively and screen and monitor those side effects. There are other side effects that we see with biologic medications, such as demyelinating disorders, which are particularly seen with anti-TNF agents. By demyelinating disorders, I mean conditions like multiple sclerosis. And it doesn't, we don't think that biologic medication cause demyelination of the brain, but they can uncover or speed up development of multiple sclerosis or other demyelinating conditions in people who are destined or predisposed to get those diseases. So people who have any neurological symptoms suggestive of demyelinating disorders, and those are usually episodes of blindness or very unexplained numbness or tingling, loss of strength in their bodies or other neurological symptoms. We are very careful about putting those people on biologic medications. Or if you have a first degree relatives with very definitive multiple sclerosis, that is not a definitive contraindication, but a kind of a concerning sign. So as I said, demyelinating disorders are being associated with anti-TNF agents and not necessarily with other biologic medications with different mechanisms of action. Um, we also... <laughs> so um, those are concerns that we have, and those are the most common concerns. There are obviously uh, a <coughs> big slew of other con you know, side effects that have been as, you know, reported in patients taking biologic medications. Are they caused by, uh, by the drugs, or it's a pure chance? or is it like a distant association? It's really hard to, uh, to know, um, just because you know they are so rare. 
Um, if you look at the product monograph for each medication, there are probably a couple of pages of conditions that have been seen in patients with uh, taking biologic medications. But we really cannot establish the you know, causation or even a strong association with biologic medications. So for that reason, we can really use them as a contraindications or, or you know, declare those as a side effect. However, if patient develops something unusual or strange that um, uh, coincides with the uh, onset of treatment and disappears with the treatment discontinuation, it is, it is very suggestive of you know, connection to the drug. And obviously, we usually don't recommend discontinuation and you know, switch to a, a different different drug. Thank you. Does that answer the question? Yes. Sure. Oh, because I think because we're already you? talking about the biologics drug, um, or there's very many of them, but do any biologics drugs, are they known, like the TNF inhibitors, are they known to actually prevent the progression of any kind of bony deposits or growth in the spinal column? Or is there any medications that are known to do that? Yes, so very important questions, and it's not important to patients and physicians. It's also very important to um, uh, insurances because they obviously want to pay for the drugs that not only treat your symptoms or patient symptoms, they want to um, make sure we're addressing the underlying mechanism of disease and therefore preventing the consequences of the disease. So it's very easy with rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, biologic medications definitely demonstrate uh, what we call disease-modifying properties, which means they prevent, radi er, prevent radiographic damage to the joints. They prevent erosions, they prevent um, 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 destruction of the joints, they prevent deformities. In fact, in some um, rare instances, they even demonstrate reversibility of the damage that's already been done to the joints. So that's very easy to, you know, to, to speak about those effects in people with rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. People with ankylosing spondylitis, the story goes a little bit muddy. Um, and it's partially due to the fact that we have, we don't have the absolutely best methods of assessing disease progression. As Dr. Mosher mentioned, the X-ray changes take a long time to develop, and the the appearance on X-ray probably really uh, is be, is um, delayed by um, it, it's not, it, it's not in the same. Um, kind of follows the same pattern as the clinical progression of the disease. So whatever we see on x-ray probably reflects the state of the disease five or eight years ago. So it's not a very sensitive method of assessing disease progression. The most sensitive method is MRI, but we cannot use it as a, a method of monitoring disease progression due to its availability. So usually MRI is being used once, maybe twice in a disease course to help us establish the diagnosis and maybe later on to assess eff effectiveness of the treatment. But it's definitely not a technique that we can utilize on annual or biannual method to monitor disease progression. So we use um, patient reported outcome to, um, to estimate success of our treatment, such as morning stiffness, patient reported pain, and as you can appreciate, those, fact, th those uh, outcomes are very subjective, and sometimes we not, um, they, they kind of discordant with the real level of inflammation, so because they, they could be impacted by other factors in patient life. So for that reason, I'm just setting up the stage, the true, to, to talk about true disease progression of ankylosing spondylitis is challenging. 
And most of the patients that we have in our practice now have delayed time of the diagnosis. So the, the trials that's been done so far looking at the effect of the biologic agents on the radiographic progression of ankylosing spondylitis, initial trials, showed no effect on the disease progression. So we said, yes, people feel better, they have less stiffness, they move better, they function better, the pain is improved. But unfortunately, disease keeps progressing if you look at the serial x-rays. However, later on, we were able to engage people um, with lesser, du le uh, lesser duration of the disease. So not those who had disease for 15 or 20 years, but disease who've been diagnosed sooner and who've been treated sooner. And we looked at them not in an interval of one or two years, but we looked at the interval of four or five years. And in that particular population, uh, people with shorter duration of the disease, less severe disease, and people who were treated sooner, we actually saw that biologics do make difference. But you need to wait at least four years to see the separation of the graphs on the people who are being treated with biologics and who are not being treated with biologics. So the short answer is ankylosing spondylitis, unfortunately, still keeps progressing. But the rate of progression could be slowed down by at least 50% by biologic medications if people diagnosed and treated in time. Is that dif differentiated by TNF blockers versus IL-22 blockers? Like well, unfortunately, we don't have five years experience with the new drugs. And as we said, to demonstrate that separation, that you know the, the, the long-term benefit on X-ray progression, you need to wait until at least four to five years. So it remains to be seen. Thank you very much. Bye, Maria. Let's take the opportunity to give the two ladies at the back a round of applause for making this happen today. They're, they're leaving for Toronto. So We'll see you on the other side. Thank you. Okay, um, did you want to go ahead, uh, Diane? So these were difficult ones. I think this is related to the microbiome. Uh, the first part was whether uh, helicobacter infection was related to the condition or caused the condition or that the treatments caused helicobacter infection. So helicobacter infection is an infection in the stomach that causes stomach upset, can cause ulcers in the stomach. Um, it's not related to ankylosing spondylitis. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs do not cause that, but they have the same symptoms that you get with taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So someone who has stomach upset, and they're on non steroidal anti-inflammatories, we stop them and they don't get better, you need to consider do, they, do you actually have a helicobacter infection as well, which can be treated with antibiotics and, um, and uh, a medication to decrease the acid in your stomach. Um, so there's not a relationship except the symptoms might be the same as the anti-inflammatory. It needs to be worked out. The second, uh, so there is also another about gluten. You just, what about the effect of gluten on uh, inflammatory? Um, bowel conditions or ankylosing spondylitis or any of these diseases. So celiac disease is a disease where you actually have an allergy to gluten where you actually slough, where the inside part of your, of your gut can't absorb things because the, um, the, um, the, the absorption place the, where you absorb is wiped out because of the gluten itself. So that, so when you have celiac disease, you absolutely cannot have any gluten. However, there is some overlap, a little bit of celiac disease with some of these other diseases that we see. There, and so we don't know the answer about gluten-free diet. Some people with psoriasis have said on a gluten-free diet that their psoriasis has disappeared, their psoriatic arthritis is better. Um, some people with AS also tell us that. So I think that's a question that still needs to be answered, whether a gluten-free diet actually, you know, what is the, the difference taking that? Of any diet that you might try, that would be the one that you would try with these diseases. There's, there, might be some, uh, there might be some benefit, but it's not known. Um, there was a question whether antiparasites would be helpful. Um, Parasites aren't causing this disease, so antiparasites wouldn't be helping any of these diseases. Your microbiome is your immune, 
you know, the microbiome is all the bacteria that have actually evolved with us as human beings um, and that have grown up with us. And really the relationship with that has been, um, the relationship of that microbiome in us is actually how we've developed. And our immune systems develop because of this microbiome as well. But something related to our genetics sometimes particularly these diseases or genetics and how we might react to something and whether one of those bugs looks like something else and our immune system then reacts abnormally is probably the case. So the most part, this microbiome is us and that we work harmoniously together, but sometimes things get out of whack. Exactly how we could change that microbiome to put things right again it is really uh, something that's of great interest in the, next, in the next few years or next decade, but antiparasites aren't going to change that. Thank you. Um, okay, so then there's some questions here on exercise and stretching. Um, I think most of this was covered um, as far as the types of stretching that are performed static or burst, um, types of activities to avoid uh, probably high impact, but let's get to kind of the thing that gets us in the gym, and I probably want to hear from Carolyn and uh, Josh on this, is how can you exercise if you're fatigued all the time, it's a catch-22, there's no energy, there's no exercise, what's the solution? Okay. Yeah, I'll that? start first. I mean, the, the one exercise I do constantly is I, I'm always kind of, because I, I, I think the lower back for me is a little bit fused and same with the SI, so I constantly try to do the hamstrings, and it doesn't take much to give her one of those, you know, like that's fairly easy for me and, and I, I, I get pretty significant uh, stretching in my hamstrings from that, so I mean, I'm doing that one quite often. Uh, that's probably the one I do most is just, you know, that right there. Um, Thanks, Josh. Yeah, so I think um, fatigue is often one of the symptoms that patients struggle with the most and fatigue is quite multifactorial and sometimes it's been that people have had such poor sleep because they've been up in the second half of the night because uh, if their uh, disease is active uh, then it often interferes with sleep. We do know that exercise and aerobic exercise in particular can help people uh, with fatigue but it is hard to uh, get to the gym and, and start when you're feeling so tired. But what I try to tell patients is that um, even if you are feeling quite fatigued, if you can start and do something, most people will feel better. So people get home from a day of work, they're exhausted, they just want to sit on the sofa and do nothing. But if they're able to get out and do a short walk, it's very rare of the person who'll come in after doing that who says, oh, I feel worse. I wish I hadn't gone for that walk. They actually sort of go, oh, you know what? I'm so glad I went out and did that. 10 minute walk around the block. So sometimes it's, it's a matter of making this um, a routine and, and starting at a very low level. Um, and you need to make it, and I, I think I, I didn't sort of mention this, something that is sustainable with your lifestyle. And so you have to look at your life and if you are coping with a job, a family, other commitments, where you're gonna fit exercise into your life. And that is, can be challenging, because often I would say to a patient, you know, to exercise when you feel at your best. That would be the ideal recommendation, but for many of us who have very busy schedules, we're not able to do that exercise piece at the best time of the day. But I think what is good to remember, and as Josh has just sort of highlighted, you don't need to do it all in one go. And that's why I try to tell patients, if you are sitting at a desk at work try to break up that position as much as possible. Maybe try to get up from your uh, desk and, and walk up to the floor above you on a set of stairs and down. You're incorporating movement and shorter um, bursts of exercise and it is cumulative. Uh, and that might help people get started and once they, they start, then they often feel better. The, the fatigue lessens and people often with regular exercise even sleep better and then that all sort of just snowballs in patients starting to feel better. But make sure you don't bite off more than you can chew on that first thing, that you just start with a very low amount. I hope that... Um, there was a study done uh, at the University of Calgary showing the benefits of dog walking 
and so that people improving their pain, uh, they were able to uh, show that they had improved their pain by dog walking. So you, you could volunteer at the SPCA if you didn't want to <laughs> buy a dog, get a dog. But um, but just in terms of forcing you to get out and and uh, you know sometimes it's also mood related that your energy level is down. And there's evidence that being in green space makes a difference versus being inside and indoors. Um, and perhaps that's why the dog walking helped as you were outside and you're walking and you're there's purpose. Just going to add, some people misinterpret fatigue for pain, so you just make need to make sure that you communicate your symptoms to your physicians, and men mention the fatigue because sometimes maybe it's your disease is not well controlled, and fatigue is a, can be caused by ongoing inflammation. So maybe change in a disease in, in disease treatment will improve your fatigue level. And sometimes, as I said, sometimes people feel fatigued, but it's really not fatigue, but it's some kind of pain that they, they misinterpret. Um, the second part of that I think I can answer is, if you have access to rheumatologist is limited to one visit of 15 to 30 minutes per year, how can AS be managed on a proactive basis? So, I mean, that's why the Canadian spondylitis is here. We're trying to help facilitate um, this type of conversation. So whatever you need, you ask us. If we don't have the answers within, then we have a powerful team of specialists that we can get those answers for you. So I encourage you to engage. Um, is the link between ASP, I'm not sure what that is, um, and depression chemical hormonal? I'm not sure ASP, maybe it's, okay. Okay. So you mentioned it in the presentation that uh, depression is a common side effect, but then following that statement, it was a lot of um, those individuals going through it are often feeling a lot, and is the depression associated a chemical diagnosable depression and corrected by medication, or is it we're all just going through a really tough time and it's hard to manage? So it depends on the situation. Um, but there's lots of evidence to show that people with inflammation have an interruption in their neurotransmitters that often leads to depression. An inflammatory disease compared to people with other types of chronic pain, the incidence of depression is about three times as high. And so it's less likely to be just, I'm depressed because I have a crappy disease and more likely related to the disease. But also, as I mentioned, if you have chronic pain that is sort of changing how those neurons work, it affects your pain, but it also leads to some symptoms of depression and anxiety. And that's part of why some of the antidepressants work, is just by modifying those. So regardless of the situation, if you're feeling very depressed, it's still worthwhile to get treatment for that depression no matter what the situation is, if it's really bad, especially if you have, you know, you're very down and there's concerns about your safety. Um, I can probably comment a little bit. It's going to lead us to the last, uh, the next question. We're at 1228. I don't know if we're going to get punished by staying longer, um, but we can maybe ask for forgiveness later. So we'll keep going, um, but this kind of relates a little bit. I mean, I'm under treatment for that specifically. You're a man, I'm a man. I mean, when we are under these types of conditions and uh, treatment options, basically our gas tank is empty. So for me, I've gone into a doctor at in the bottom 2% of testosterone levels. Um, so I'm currently being seen by them. I'm trying to adjust those. It's making a difference in my mood, making a difference in my fatigue. Uh, and fatigue right now is my uh, biggest symptom. So that leads me into the female side of things. Uh, also, I mean, when, when you have inflammation, it's in your brain, and that's contributing to your mental and your mood. And So from a female perspective, are homo hormones have any effect on AS, menopause, or I think it's monthly cycles? The short answer is no. Um, there are uh, certain autoimmune conditions that demonstrate relationship to uh, female hormones. The most um, striking example would be systemic lupus erythematosus that we know that can be um, the disease activity can um, 
be associated with significant uh, changes in women's um, life, um, like um, you know, pregnancies, uh, deliveries, menopause. However, all attempts of the um, researchers to employ hormonal treatment or hor hormonal interventions in um, you know, managing disease activity have been unsuccessful. So we observationally, we know that there is a certain connections, but we don't know how to employ or how to use those connections in a therapeutic way. And as I said, lupus is probably the most um, um, bright example of those connections, and it's less established in conditions like ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis. So these are three questions kind of all in the same ballpark, so bear with me when I go through them, but uh, my prescription for Biologic X was rejected by my insurance company. They'll be providing a biosimilar. Does the research indicate any difference in effectiveness of TNF inhibitors versus biosimilars? Wait until I finish the next because it's all kind of uh, cost related. So do you have an influence with Alberta Health to convince them to cover the biologics? And uh, how do you help patients overcome financial barriers to treatment? So three questions on affordability, some a little bit more specific, but so based so so it's good. It's interesting times um, that we uh, you know that the we have the biologics, the anti TNF agents that have been around now since uh, 2000, and the patent has run out. And infleximab or Remicade is the first one, and a tenorcept, and also adalimumab. So that. Um, They've, so that biosimilar medications, companies are producing biosimilar medications. Um, it's not the same as a generic, a gener because biologics are biologic products. They're not chemical drugs. Um, you can produce a generic that's a chemical drug that's the same, but these are biosimilar. And so the companies that are producing the biosimilars, many of them are the exact same companies that are producing the originator drugs. So that's number one to be reassured. And so the quality assurance, et cetera, with that is, is, is the same. In um, then Health Canada as well, that they have uh, done extensive uh, amount of work with the biosimilars coming in to ensure the similarity between the same drugs. Um, if you took infleximab or Remicade, and the original, and because every time they produce a new batch of that, it is also slightly different, because uh, somehow in the process or different, it will be slightly different. So that even when you're getting the biologic, the originator company, each time you get it, it's probably, each batch is probably a little bit different. And some people, sometimes you may have said, do you know what, I took my injection this time and it just didn't work. Sometimes, you know, there may be, there's differences in batches as they are. So that the similarity between them is no, between a, an originator and a biosimilar, that the difference between them is no different than what it has been uh, from the batch that you originally had of the first Remicade than it is to what you're getting for Remicade or Infleximab now. So the, um, at the present time, um, so there's been a lot of discussion and so forth. Well, they haven't done the big clinical trials like they've done with, um, with others, but we do have more information coming that we are, people are able to be on one biosimilar and switch to another. Uh, at the present time, that in the province of Alberta, that if we are starting um, for Alberta Blue Cross to cover it on the non-group, which is the provincial program, that if you're starting a new biologic that's either infleximab, which is the trade name was Remicade, or etanercept, which pre the, pre the originator was Embrel, that you need to start with the uh, biosimilar agent because of significant cost reductions for this. That there is no, at the present time, there's not uh, any mandate to do switching, which means that you would be told next time you go to pick up your drug that you're not getting that any longer, you're getting another. 
Um, but I think that there's, there's discussion of that and what is, the, um, what is the right way to do that? How do we ensure that you have continued support for, your, for, 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 your, for the medication, um, continued support to make sure that it's renewed, et cetera? Those things all have to be addressed. In terms of what are we doing with government, um, with government that we've been um, at the Canadian Rheumatology Association has been working uh, with the Arthritis Society, uh, looking at, uh, at, uh, at what, they're, um, you know, what they say about this. The Canadian Rheumatology Association now says that yes, using um, uh, biosimilars for starts is not an issue, that we need it more information for switching. We are getting more information for switching, which it doesn't look like it is a problem at least from the studies that have been done to date. Um, but um, you know, there are issues that need to be solved about switching. Norway switched everyone, Denmark switched everyone, Scotland has switched everyone, and there's not been issues. And so I think what we can do best for, patient, for people is to reassure them and not to, to create a bunch of, um, of anxiety unnecessarily about this. But that we um, and that we'll get experience certainly by using the biosimilars in new people, and uh, continue to try to work. And uh, myself and Dr. Joanne Helmick, who's in um, Edmonton, uh, trying to work with government so that there might be, um, you know, so that that concerns are addressed. I don't know whether we have any voice or not, but all we can do is knock on the door and try. I don't know if you have anything else to say about that. Um, I have one thing to say back to biosimilars. Well, two things. Um, one is most people have no issue with generic drugs when they go to the pharmacy and get them. And pretty much every time you go to the pharmacy, you could be getting any of 15 different drugs for most drugs. And most people don't think twice about that. There can be up to a 20% difference between generics and um, your regular drugs. And most people notice no difference. There might be small variations. With biosimilars, that difference is much tinier, and therefore, I think it's, you're probably less likely to run into any issues that way. So I don't think people should really be concerned if you've been on generic drugs, really, I think you're fine with any of the biosimilars. The other thing we have to note with the funding thing is we're lucky in Canada that a large chunk of our um, drug stuff is subsidized. Um, we're cheaper with biologics in general than many other countries, but often the government is paying a large amount of the biologics, and there's more and more and more coming, and more and more expense. So if they don't find a way to control the cost of biologics in general, that will likely make it less available to a larger population. Thank you. We're going to try to get into a bit of a speed round here. Uh, the person that asked this question, please raise your hand. I think you're the newest volunteer. Um, how can we have more specialists become aware of support groups like CSA, be the place to refer patients? Would it be beneficial to reach out to specialists, office clinics to bring more awareness? Of what support groups, networks are available within that community? What do you recommend? Could this be facilitated? So identify yourself, please. Ah, oh, you're already, uh, okay. So that's your job. <laughs> and you're, you're now trying to outsource it. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I, for one, <laughs> is, that, uh, is that we would really like to have more of those pamphlets in the clinic, that the ankylosing spondylitis, so we mentioned that. Those would be very helpful, so that's the first time we're see seeing that booklet, and when you have the psoriatic, so that come by Richmond Road Clinic and drop them off. Um, I think that Richmond Road Clinic uh, is where the ankylosing spondylitis psoriatic arthritis clinic is. I think that you're always welcome, and that uh, making sure that the information is there, and that we're, and yes, that would be, you're really helpful. 
and also if we were involved in uh, patient education classes, which we do have the patient that uh, Alex and uh, Carolyn run, and so that they're able to do that. And as we build more patient education, which gets back to the uh, last person's point about 15 minute appointment once a year, how can we actually <laughs> improve upon that? And that's probably in, in, in offering more, um, more programs, more education programs, more times that people can get together. Try to get to the mic, because for everyone else listening on tape, you'll probably have an issue. There you go. Uh, one thing that I kind of suggested within the CSA is to have a designated volunteer reaching out to doctor's offices and such like yours, where there is a gatekeeper, so to speak, in introducing the CSA and being able to get you on, say, a mailing list. Do you think that is something that would be an advantage? And how likely would your gatekeeper let you know about so, uh, a support group like us? Um, well, we are, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's not so much a gatekeeper as it is a time concern. So uh, we have for 15, 20 minutes for follow up with the patient. And sometimes it's once a year, sometimes it's twice a year. So in that 15 minutes, we have to accomplish lots of things. And, you know, the, the disease itself, the overall well being, the treatment, the side effects, the monitoring the comorbidities, um, the physio. So it's lots of things to, you know, to uh, cover in those short visits. And we have lack of um, manpower or person power, as I learn this more politically correct term. Mm -hmm. um, so we really have to uh, stretch ourselves sometimes too thin to, um, to hit all the points during those appointments. So what one of the ways how I think you might um, kind of popularize yourself is uh, by working closely with patient support programs through pharma. Because all the patients who are receiving biologic medications, they are being enrolled in a patient support programs and they are being contacted on a regular basis to monitor the side effects, to um, more, you know, just generally for general, you know, regular checkups, and uh, they're being offered different services by um, patient support programs. So, if you can establish your relationship with with those programs, and um, you know, coordinators can uh, inform patients about your existence, I think that you know, like they have really more time to you know to discuss it. I think back to the other uh, a aspect about the 15 minute appointments is that uh, it is well known that uh, having team based care is uh, patients have better outcomes with team based care. And then it's also, you, you have your, your physiotherapist, nurse, pharmacist, et cetera, who are all co managing your condition. So there shouldn't be one person that you have to be able to access, but the whole team can do it. Fortunately, that. Um, and I think this is an advocacy piece too, is that there really needs to be advocacy around team-based care because you know, we're lucky that we have Carolyn, we have Alex, but we don't have anyone else, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so it's going to be really important that we know patients do better, that their outcomes are better. We're actually modeling it now with our, um, with, um, with Deborah Marshall, who's a health economist, to do the modeling about how you're getting better outcomes when you have a team-based care, uh, and therefore the costs are less because patients are doing better and they're requiring less uh, services because you've actually provided a whole team of support. And so that's what we, I think we really need to move forward with, and that's going to be really important in terms of, of looking after patients better and something that the CSA could work with us jointly on in terms of advocacy. And I think that's a real role that we can play collectively together. Do you think it would be very, in your 15 minute window that you have with your patients and whatnot, do you think it would be too much to think about or to pass off a guidebook if they're readily available in your office to be able to share? Oh, no. So, you know, you got your intake, your initial intake with that, with that patient so there's a wealth of information to be able to provide to them and then of course you've got your recurring patients that don't know originally are now coming in because they only see you every six months to a year time so now that brings up awareness and that cross promotion with everybody yeah, and I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, the doctors here but I think that is something that uh, would be reasonable for those dedicated clinics that we have the 
booklets okay. uh, at Richmond Road, certainly that site, and this new support group that's coming out, I think it would be nice to have that um, available to let patients know, because I think this is a, a condition often, certainly with the spondyloarthritis, it's a young group of patients, um, and I think for them to have some support uh, with other patients so they don't feel quite as alone, and maybe Josh, you can talk to that a little bit, I think would be really helpful, but I think that's something that we could do, and as well, I mentioned the, um, ankylosing spondylitis class or that's being offered at Community Accessible Rehabilitation. It would be very nice to have pamphlets that could go to the three sites in Calgary and also the posters for the support group. So any of our patients who perhaps don't get it at our clinic for whatever reason yep. are, and are attending that class could also... Um, Benefit from it all. Yeah. Thank you. High fives. Um, oh, you have to, if you can, Mike. Just not for our benefit. I mean... Everyone else that's listening at home. Just in regard to that, um, I guess, topic, there's, through at least Calgary, there's the PCNs, and maybe there's a way to get a slide up on the PCN boards that run through the offices, because lots of them have the TVs and the PCN ad announcements and stuff. So maybe, you know, trying to get a, an awareness slide through the PCNs would be another way for patient notification or, you know, awareness at least um, that's thank you and that's a good suggestion that's quite easy to do because we meet with the primary care networks on a monthly basis in terms of access and improving access so that would be a, an easy thing for us to do too lots of solutions here in Calgary I like it um, and we have I mean you're the best represented province in in the country outside of Ontario with board members so let's utilize that and we can create models and share um, I have to be respectful of everyone's time and we are late and we've been losing some people so let me leave with something and then for those that didn't get answered then we'll commit to uh, getting to them on our website. Um, so for comorbidity issues, who should we expect asked to coordinate care? Is this the family doctor, rheumatologist, internal medicine doctor? Doctors are hesitant to go outside their area. Who? can and should act as the quarterback. So before it gets to these guys, I mean, I can say personally, this is really why I'm involved in advocacy because I've had to assemble this team uh, myself. And unfortunately, I mean, you're the one that's closest to it. So uh, we can't have expectations of people to be outside of their area of expertise. This is where I think comorbidities is gonna really help us um, communicate and have questions. So. I mean, our, inter our intention is to create programs that show you how to have an effective appointment so that we're, when you're in there for 15 minutes and you have everything written down, it takes seven. And then you can get into some deeper stuff. So I think for me as a patient and what I would advise to anyone, even if the answer is I should be your quarterback, I, I think your own involvement in your condition is going to probably benefit you the most. And I agree with that, and, but it, the primary care physician, that's you know, the medical home, and they are the they're, you know, they're ones who best can set up to be the quarterback for most of it, and you know, we communicate directly with them. And you know, sometimes it's us because they, I can get the access or, or that someone doesn't have a family doctor, but for the most part, it should be working with the, um, working with the family physician as the, as the quarterback with yourself also. And I think you have to be your own advocate and you have to understand your own disease, that that's crucial. And quickly, I'll end with a few, try to do these quick, but high, high impact sports like volleyball, beneficial, detrimental. I think we heard about this a little bit, about knowing your body and, um, I mean, I know people that do powerlifting, that do skiing. Um, I know people that play hockey still. I think it's knowing your own body and making sure that you're aware of how much yeah. to go. Right? And it really um, depends on the, um, the, your disease state and, and if there's any structural damage or fusion in the spine, uh, that would really uh, dictate what sort of recommendations uh, and regarding high impact. So sports that have the um, contact sports where you could be tackled or things like that would be, you know, fall uh, from skiing, um, you know, could be uh, a risky activity to engage in if you've got significant fusion in your spine, but it also depends if, you know, you're uh, a person who skied all their lives, uh, life and you have that skill set for skiing and it's something you want to continue, but you do have to know uh, the inherent risks if there is fusion in your spine. And uh, 
what to avoid, and that's usually the high contact and high impact sports. Very short answer, please. Is methotrexate used as well as IL-17 to deter immune system response to help uh, prevent failure? I think that we don't actually, so it was interesting, that's something I learned in the last two days, was in the um, in ankylosing spondylitis that the addition of methotrexate we thought was not necessary in terms of the how long or how well the medication would work. With IL-17, we don't have any information on that yet, that um, the studies were not done with methotrexate. So. Yeah, so sub subgroup analysis showed that people who were on IL-17 monotherapy versus IL-17 in combination with methotrexate performed equally. So there was no um, uh, no effect on a, um, how well medication is working. In terms of uh, protecting the medication against uh, anti-drug antibodies formation, is not well known because the drug hasn't been on the market for too long, but we think that IL-17 do not cause formation of the um, anti-drug antibodies. It's not the same, in it, like there's no neutralizing antibodies that in the same degree as anti-TNF medications cause. So the short answer is that methotrexate is probably not as important or the, as far as we know right now, is not needed for effectiveness or for prevention of the drug failure with IL-17 medications. Um, stem cell therapy, uh, we addressed this in Toronto maybe three weeks ago, so I think we can point to people, but, but the, the, me the message was really um, not really effective here in spondyloarthritis. Um, then we have uh, Alex, I would assume that any use of naturopathic treatments, supplements, um, interfere with medications given by rheumatologists? I mean, you probably communicate what you're doing to everyone, or? Um, there's a wide variety of natural products that are out there. Uh, some are helpful, some are safe, some interact, some um, are harmful. And there's more and more coming out all the time. Um, I think the big thing is, is if you're not getting adequate um, benefit from the therapies that you've got, I think you need to go back or come back and see us to try other things. Um, if there's something like turmeric that's pretty much been shown, it doesn't have a lot of side effects to it, that's pretty much fine for everyone, but there's all kinds of other ones that can interfere. So. Um, talking to me if you're a patient in our clinic or um, going to the pharmacist or having someone really look into it. Um, having just have, because it's on the shelf doesn't mean it's safe. Interaction wise, generally we have no idea. Most things, unless they're very common, have absolutely no studies looking at interactions. So I don't recommend them. Um, I'm not opposed to people trying them if I'm convinced they're safe. Okay, two more. Um, so the topic of medical cannabis came up. Um, I mean, let's just be realistic here. It's not the miracle drug. It is effective for some people. Um, currently, it's being used a lot to treat symptoms, and you can go deeper on that and, and start to look at how it affects your immune system. Um, so more information coming out from us on that for sure, um, but uh, maybe Josh, could you go a little bit deeper on that? Yeah, so for more, what, what I know about the cannabis is there's, there's, there's anti-inflammatory properties to it. The CBD of the cannabis plant has anti-inflammatory properties. And uh, in terms of the THC, the THC does have pain-fighting properties as well. I've been using it probably since I was 21 or 22, right around the same time as my diagnosis every day. And I don't know, in terms of side effects, negative side effects, there's not a whole lot. There really isn't. Um, this part of my treatment really is. Uh, I don't know, it's, no one's ever died from using it, unlike some of the other medications out there, and I kind of live by that, so I don't know what else to say about that. It's good stuff, though. I mean, it's a, it's a growing industry, and, and I mean, it, we're, not, we're just not there yet, so accessibility is difficult, affordability is difficult, but uh, I mean, bear with us as we figure it out. And the last one I have here, because I want to give this person um, 
advice that says do not just live with it, but I have a meniscus tear cartilage, hence I have pain and weakness in my knees. I also have burning sensation in my legs, below knees, up to my ankles. Should I go for knee surgery or live with it? Well, I don't think we should give um, advice, you know, without actually yeah. examining the patient and, you know, like really looking into it. You know, it's it would be, you know, um, unresponsible to, you know, to to do it from the stage and give advices and medical treatment without fully examining and patient and looking into its history and results. So figure it out with your rheumatologist. I'm living proof that surgery works. I've had seven. Um, but, I mean, it's a very um, specific to you conversation with your uh, physicians and, and surgeons. And not that I'm going to suggest anything, but that's just another uh, thing to highlight is that even though you have this condition, you are susceptible to having, uh, you know, something like a meniscal tear. Uh, um, and. Um, that may re may require a surgical intervention with a scope if it's causing a locked knee or or what have you. But that's just another thing to remember that uh, when you are exercising, that you know you can injure yourself much like anybody else could, and um, sometimes that requires management. And with that, we're going to close. So um, on our way out, I mean, feel free to hang around and network and talk to other people. Um, please, let's do a big round of applause for not only the volunteers, but this lovely panel. And uh, we did it in um, we did it in Toronto. And I'd like to invite everyone else up before we leave. Let's do maybe a big group picture here, and we can throw it online and tell everyone what we're doing here. So. Um, appreciate your coming. Thank you very much for um, delaying, and I hope this was beneficial to everyone. <laughs>